This lecture will cover Ascaris lumbricoides, which is also called the giant roundworm. I'm Dr. Paul Pottinger. The objectives for this lecture are to understand the fundamentals of the Ascaris life cycle so you can break that cycle and help your patients. You should understand where this infection happens and who gets it and be able to make a diagnosis based on the way it presents clinically and based on the simple diagnostic tests that you'll learn how to do and be familiar with treatment options. Here we are on the tree of life, Ascaris lumbricoides, one of the GI nematodes. And this is the life cycle. So it begins at the bottom of the screen when there are eggs that mature in the soil. They're deposited there by people who defecate in the ground because they don't have another choice. And in the feces are eggs. Those eggs need to take one or two weeks to mature or embryonate. When that happens, within each of those eggs, there is a single microscopically small larval worm. Now, if someone eats one of those eggs, let's say they have food or drink or fingers that are contaminated with the eggs, they will be swallowed and make their way down into the GI system. For that reason, I would call this fecal soil oral transmission, just like uh, Trichuris, the whipworm. The difference, however, is that it, things become very strange indeed. What happens is that uh, these larval worms will burrow their way out of the GI lumen and get swept up into the venous blood and get brought up into the right heart and pumped out into the lungs. And there they will stay as microscopically small larval worms. They will molt once and twice and then eventually get coughed up and swallowed and go right back down into the GI tract. So this feature of lung migration is different by comparison to, say, the pinworm or uh, the whipworm. Now, why they do this, I do not know. I have asked them. They will not talk. I suspect that what's happening is that they just groove on the higher oxygen tension that's affordable in the lungs that you definitely do not get in the GI tract. Regardless, they do this, and that's important to you as a doctor because you may make a diagnosis clinically when patients present with that acute lung phase. We call that lung inflammation or pneumonitis. I'll tell you more about that in a moment. But to complete the life cycle, yep, they make their way back down into the gut and then eventually mature into worms. They look for all the world almost exactly like an earthworm, except that the ends are pointier, but otherwise the same size as what you would take out to go fishing on the lake, right? Those worms will then uh, find each other, boy meets girl, they have sex in the human, that makes the human the definitive host uh, of Ascaris, and the eggs are deposited back into the soil. This is a human infection, an anthroponosis. There's a very closely related pig form of Ascaris, but this one is built for Homo sapiens. And again, those eggs have to get out of the body to complete the life cycle. They will not hatch inside of you because your body temperature is too high. They can't mature that way. Each female will lay hundreds of thousands of eggs per day, and each adult will live for about a year's time. Where does this happen? It happens in the tropics, same location that we see with the whipworm. Uh, there's often an overlap with that other infection. Any place where there's poor sanitation and where there's warm weather, uh, not too cold, uh, to mature those eggs in the soil. About one out of every four people on the planet has this infection, although most of the infection happens in poor or disadvantaged children in the tropics. So how does it present clinically? The paradigm is that early illness will show up as lung migration. Later illness will show up due to the worm burden of adults in the colon. So early on, most people actually will not have symptoms, but for those who do, we can see a syndrome called eosinophilic pneumonitis. The eosinophil is that such an important uh, host immune response to helminth infections as they traverse and migrate through your body. The eosinophil have, well, eosinophilic granules and they can be damaging to the worm. And so when the body sees a uh, worm migrating through the tissue, an eosinophilia will rise in the patient's bloodstream and also in the lung tissue itself. IgE is the mediator of that immune response. And what does it do to patients? They can have a cough, they can wheeze, they can develop chest pain. Sometimes they'll even cough up blood. That's called homoptysis. And if we check, check a chest x-ray, we can see that they have what's called a low bar infiltrate. This looks for all the world like a classic bronchopneumonia. If you look in the sputum, you may see that patients have eosinophils where they shouldn't otherwise, or this funny finding called the Charcot-Leiden crystal. The Charcot-Leiden crystal simply tells you that there is a high burden of eosinophils within that pleural fluid. This is often called Luffler's syndrome. 
Now, later on, once they've made their way out of the lungs, been coughed up and swallowed, and grown into adults, well, most people still have no symptoms. The worms are well tolerated, but sometimes what will happen is the patient will poop and out will come a worm. That always gets people's attention. The other thing that gets the attention of the gastroenterologist is they may be scoping a patient and see the adults wriggling around through the bowel. There's your problem. Some of these patients will have symptoms, and the classic things are a nonspecific syndrome of nausea, belly pain, uh, or diarrhea. Many of these kids are malnourished. It's not clear to me that their malnutrition is directly related to Ascaris. It may also be related to other factors with their diet or other worms that may be there present at the same time. Regardless, you can imagine that if you pass this many worms, you may have had issues with your nutrition. Now, these are worms that came out of a single child that was treated by doctors uh, uh, in a tropical area, and these kinds of photos uh, are not at all unusual. The problem with Ascaris isn't that. The problem is that it may cause complications. Complications include bowel blockage. Uh, in the upper panel here, you can see this is someone whose small bowel has just absolutely packed with, uh, with worms. It's hard to get their food and stool through their system. And these worms can also go where they don't belong. So if there's a worm that sees the sphincter of Odie, it may crawl right up into the biliary tree, and that causes blockage of the biliary flow. That leads to biliary sepsis. Sometimes they make their way right out of the intestines and into the peritoneal cavity, dragging fecal coliform bacteria with them. That's a disease called peritonitis. They can go elsewhere in the body as well. How do you make a diagnosis? Well, you need to suspect it. Has your patient been to an area of poor sanitation and do they have a GI syndrome? If so, check the poop. Look for the eggs in a fecal prep. Have them give a specimen, send it to the lab, do an O and P prep, and if you see these crenellated, lumpy bumpy, or mammillated eggs, you've made a diagnosis. That's Ascaris. If a patient calls your clinic and says, I just pooped out a worm, say, don't flush. Fetch it, bring it in in a bag, and we'll make an ID. If it looks like this, you've made your diagnosis, it's Ascaris. In addition, a gastroenterologist may make a diagnosis, of course, doing routine colonoscopy. It's also seen on imaging. So this is an ultrasound of a patient's gallbladder. They thought this patient had gallstones. What they actually have is a worm wriggling around, eating and grooving on all the biliary fluid that's there, the bile. And here's a patient who had a GI series. This is someone who has an x-ray of the belly after they've swallowed a contrast agent like barium. You can see the negative impression that the worm makes because they're excluding barium. And if you look really carefully where the arrows are, you can actually see the barium meal of the worm as they eat the barium themselves. So what do you do when you make a diagnosis? Kill the worms. And we have a variety of drugs that work. Albendazole, Mubendazole, Parentel Pamoite, they're all perfectly fine for this condition. In the USA, we will typically use mabendazole or albendazole. But the most important thing is to manage those complications. If your patient has peritonitis because a worm has gone ectopic, gone rogue, gone walkabout, you got to get that worm out of there. If the worm has gone into the biliary system, a gastroenterologist can use a technique called endoscopic retrograde cholangiopancreatography, or ERCP, where they can visualize that worm, use a little forceps to literally grab it and pull it out of the way, establishing normal flow of the bile. Finally, wear your public health hat, break that cycle. When you enhance sanitation, enhance hand hygiene, you can make such a huge difference for these patients. If they have a place to deposit their feces, those worms will not be able to embryonate as eggs and mature. It's also been tried in a variety of situations to give uh, albendazole or mubendazole to patients on a mass drug administration basis. Periodically go into villages and give everybody a dose of this medicine because the worms respond very briskly, very rapidly to these treatments. That's totally great, but unless they have a place to deposit their feces, the cycle will be perpetuated and reinfection is, is common. So these are the key concepts for Ascaris lumbricoides. It's also called the giant roundworm for totally obvious reasons. It is one of the roundworms uh, that uh, has crenulated eggs. The transmission is fecal to soil to oral, and it has that funny, weird thing where it also migrates through the lung early on. It happens every place in the tropics, but especially in kids, especially the disadvantaged, and reinfection is common unless you can fix the sewage system in your community. Clinically, they may present with a lung syndrome called Luffler's syndrome, wheeze, cough, eosinophilic pneumonitis, and a bronchopneumonia. They may have a nonspecific GI upset. They may have a bowel obstruction, and in catastrophic conditions, the adults may go ectopic where they don't belong. To make a diagnosis, check the poop.
or look at the adult that the patient brings you in your office. You can treat uh, with any of these medications. They're all effective. It's all about prevention and improving sanitation in that community. Thank you for your attention.